welcome to today's discussion where i'll be discussing uh, how to diagnose uh, and then also some uh, things of management of chronic pancreatitis read this uh, clinical uh, history take a minute and read it So it's a middle uh, age person who has a upper abdominal pain and it's six months so it has to be a chronic pathology and of course he is uh, sent to the clinic by his GP who has treated him for some time. Person has felt some relief but as uh, the problem was continuing he was referred uh, to make a diagnosis and then to plan the management so making a diagnosis as we have discussed earlier we have to find what is the organ at fault and then the pathology so first for upper abdominal pain list what are the organs possible and the pathologies so if it's six months we have to think of more chronic problems so pause the video and then make a list of your differential diagnosis. So once you are completed, now just this diagram will tell you what are the organs to uh, get involved in your differential diagnosis. But of course sometimes uh, cardiac pain can come here and also behind these peritoneal structures of course you have the retroperitoneum pancreas is also retroperitoneum behind that you have the aorta so aortic pathologies are also possible so once this anatomical picture is built in your mind then knowing the organs and then with your background pathology just picks up some chronic pathologies so i'm sure you have got this differential diagnosis peptic ulcer disease chronic cholecystitis, chronic pancreatitis, angina, mesenteric angina, aortic aneurysm, then any form of early upper GI malignancies. So now we have to take a history. In the history we have two tasks. One thing is to find which is the organ and then in that organ what is the possible pathology. So to find the organ, the clues that we have, one thing is the site. So using the site only we have got this down. And then the other thing is of course that we have discussed is to use some inlet or outlet symptoms. Like say like peptic ulcer disease. If you have hematemesis or malina or symptoms of chronic blood loss. So it could be peptic ulcer disease or it could be again early gastric malignancy or the person has some dysphagia is it early CSFACUS so these are your inlet and outlet symptoms and then functional uh, changes so say like take chronic pancreatitis the functions of the pancreas are the endocrine and exocrine function so you can have a failure of exocrine function the person having steatory and also due to malabsorption he will lose weight and then the endocrine failure the person may be diabetic if it's a anginal pain functional you can have other things of cardiac failure like shortage of blood down exertion paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea edema so anyway so these are the keys with these keys now we have to get him to the history of the presenting complaint and try to look what is the diagnosis so because it's a six months history one would one, one important thing is to look at the the time distribution of the pain is it just like once a week pain or once a month pain so occasional pains coming on and off or is it like going having during most of the most of the days so if it's a just on and off pain, 
then it may be something like a biliary colic or maybe a bit of pancreatic pain coming on but if it's a more persistent pain then the, the, any of these chronic pathologies are possible and also how uh, severe it is if it's a mild pain or a moderate pain it's very unlike to be severe all the time but they can have acute severe exacerbations so if there are severe exacerbations a biliary colic is possible or whether they are getting acute attacks on top of their chronic pancreatitis so these things are important so our patient he had the pain during most of the days and what he has noticed is now over the six months the frequency of pain is getting more and also the intensity is little more bothering him so it's a more uh, so most of the days he has felt this pain and then now to look at if it's a whether it's a upper GI pathology another thing that we can use is is there any relationship to meals because if there's a relationship to, to meals it's more likely to be a GI pathology and a bit unlike to be one of these vascular problems but of course mesenteric cancer again it can come up uh, with the meals because again it's a GI pathology but the cardiac the pain or aortic and some pain is a bit unlike to be related to meals so this person's pain had it usually tend to follow meals so it's very likely that he's having a GI pathology and then now what are other other features of the pain that we can use so looking at these pathologies one thing is that we can see whether he has any form of blood loss GI losses in that if there is a history of malina or hematemesis or occult blood loss shortness of breath on excession those things then peptic ulcer disease is possible now this patient denied of any hematemesis or malina of course your the shortness of breath those things we will be evaluating in your systemic inquiry so but anyway he didn't have any features of uh, blood losses where patient has noticed then another thing that we can use is the is there any radiation of the pain because a duodenal ulcer also can radiate a bit to the back but radiations are more typical of these two especially the chronic pancreatitis so this patient when the pain is more he felt that it is radiating towards the back and the next question we ask does it relieve with anything he said yes when I bend forward it, it feels I feel little better when the pain is more so most probably he's having a chronic pancreatic pain and chronic the gallbladder pain also can radiate but it's more towards more to the bit higher in the chest in between the interscapula sometimes it may radiate to the shoulder region and of course he didn't have any radiation towards the arms a distal of her angina and he said it's not related to any exertion so cardiac cause is a bit unlikely and coming after meals again mesenteric cancer is possible but in that type of situation it's very more likely that the person will have other evidence of peripheral arterial disease but he didn't have any exertional pain and also in the systemic inquiry he denied of any PVD features where he gets a intermittent claudication so this also it's a bit unlikely as the cause aortic aneurysm sometimes it may have this but then of course right into back bending forwards unlikely early upper GI malignancies so he his appetite was all right but of course he was a bit afraid to eat because of the pain and he had some loss of weight so upper GI malignancies again the possibility is there maybe a pancreatic malignancy but of course he denied any tea colored urine uh, features of jaundice but again with the, even a pancreatic malignancy early the, the jaundice may be not that apparent so but so the important thing is that you have to look at all these features whether there are any alarming features any localized features they are important so with all these avail things we thought it's more like to be a chronic pancreatitis but still other thing other 
possibilities we have to keep in mind. Then we get on, got into system king part. And there was no shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, and there was no paroxysmal of fluid dyspnea, no edema. He didn't have any chronic cough. And with chronic pancreatitis, diabetes is possible. He denied any polyuria, polydipsia, but of course, in the medical history, he was already diagnosed with diabetes. Then, bowel inquiry again, uh, the, the GI losses are important. He denied chronic edema, and his bowel habits are, uh, were fairly all right. And just to exclude the angina, I said there was no history of intermittent claudication. So, putting everything together, chronic pancreatitis is becoming the more likely diagnosis because of the chronic pain, he has a bit of acute exacerbations and during that, it radiates to the back and bending forwards makes more comfortable and is a diagnosed diabetic. And in the systemic inquiry, he denied any steatoid, but of course he had lost some weight. So, then other parts of the history are very important. Medical history as he is saying, he is a diabetic. So in these other forms, we have to think, look at are there any other complications of the disease which may manifest in the other parts of the history and also to find etiology. The other history parts of history are important. And he denied any past uh, surgical history. Social history, he was alcoholic. He had consumed alcohol for the last 10 years. Like every day he was drinking. So now things are building up more in more favor of chronic pancreatitis. And the pain was affecting his job. Uh, he was working in a shop as a helper. Now the pain keeps on disturbing him going for work. And the workplace also has warned him about that. So there are social problems building up for him now. Then also in the history, other etiological factors, some cases of the chronic pancreatitis are familial, but he didn't have any family history for chronic pancreatitis. Other things like pancreatic division or problems of the sphincter of Wadi, sometimes benign cyst of the duodenum can have chronic compression of the blood. But these, of course, in the history, it's difficult to evaluate. They will be uh, you have to find out them by investigations. So examination. So more likely diagnosis is of chronic pancreatitis, but again, important not to forget other things. So general examination. He had a slightly low BMI. He was not pale. There was no jaundice. So these are focus signs. No supraclavicular left uh, supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. Cardiovascular system was normal. Still with angina, it may be normal, but of course, now the system is okay. And so it's more uh, in favor of a diagnosis made. Respiratory system was normal. Abdominal examination, it was abdominal not distended, soft, mild tenderness into the gastric region. There were no masses and also there was no evidence of an aortic aneurysm. All the peripheral pulses are normal. So after the examination, we thought this person is very likely that he is having a, having a chronic pancreatitis. So now we have to confirm the diagnosis. So pause the video just list the investigations that you will do to confirm the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. So biochemical investigations, amylase. With chronic pancreatitis, there's not much of point doing unless it comes with acute pain. So main form of uh, diagnosis, uh, we said, when we plan, we have to think how to look at the organ. And most of the time, we look at the organs by some form of imaging or endoscopy. For pancreas, you can't visualize by endoscopy, so you, you have to look by some imaging. In the past, many years ago, 
the only investigation which was available was to do a <coughs> x-ray of the abdomen and this is a typical <coughs> thing uh, pancreatic calcification if pancreatic cal calcification is there of course you confirm the diagnosis but there may be some patients with chronic pancreatitis where there's no obvious calcification like this so now we now we depend on uh, ultrasound and much better if we can get a contrast and a CD. Initially, we can do ultrasound, which will show evidence of pancreatic, chronic pancreatic may be uh, atrophic gland, and also the pancreatic duct can get dilated due to the fibrosis catching up the duct, and also due to calcula in the in the duct, and also the ultrasound they will pick up the pancreatic calcification. And CT will of course give more evidence. Anyway, this patient underwent a CT scan of the abdomen which showed that he has evidence of chronic pancreatitis. There was some calcification but there was no duct dilatation. The pancreatic duct was not dilated in this patient. So now we have confirmed the diagnosis. So when the diagnosis is beyond doubt, other investigations to to look at other pathologies is not very important and also most of the things that we discussed will be covered by these investigations like gallbladder pathology or aortic aneurysm but for safe side if one wants to to exclude or definitely a cardiac no harm to do the gallbladder ECG and if someone wants to exclude because supposing has lost a lot of weight coexisting GI malignancy, apogee endoscopy can be done and this patient in fact because he had loss of weight, uh, we did apogee endoscopy which was normal. So now the diagnosis is established as chronic pancreatitis. So how are we going to treat this patient? So in treating any disease, we have to identify the problems. Now this is a chronic disease. So in chronic pancreatitis, what are the problems? One thing is, of course, the pain. That is the reason why he has come for our treatment. Then the functional problems. Endocrine failure. He is a diabetic and he was already on treatment and he was well controlled on oral hyperglycemics. Exocrine failure. He did not have any steer trigger, but there, there is evidence of definite endocrine failure. Pancreatic enzyme supplements can be given orally. Pancreatic duct obstruction. Now, this patient's imaging excluded a pancreatic duct obstruction, and also the bile ducts can get obstructed in some chronic pancreatitis, and here that was also excluded. Pseudocyst formation. Most of the time, pseudocysts form after an acute attack, and this one didn't have any pancreatic connections. So, here we are faced with controlling the pain. Diabetes is already being managed and other things fortunate for the patient. These complications have not still happened. So he was started on oral analgesics. So these are the two problems for him. He was started on oral analgesics and initially he was started on paracetamol with codeine and with with acute attack, we advise him to take a diclofenac with uh, some PPI. He showed some initial response, but he was saying at times the pain is uh, it's not controlled with this oral medication. So we added tramadol to take uh, when the pain is more, and then we followed him. Up. But of course. He was coming to the clinic very frequently because the pain is troubling him and it was disturbing for his work and then of course he had a couple of admissions with episodes of severe pain and he needed narcotic analgesics uh, also. So some people with the pancreatic pain you can manage pharmacologically. A significant number it's possible but then there are some people who don't respond and it's very important in this type of thing other thing is that you have to look at the etiology and get them settled 
so he is a alcoholic and then we advise him to uh, stop alcohol and the other pathologies which can get some treatment would be of course if, if there is any pancreatic duct obstruction and also if the if there is evidence of sphincter or body being tight that also can be handled by a simple towel but this patient didn't have any evidence of those so he is off alcohol diabetes getting control but the pain now he is he says it's not all right and some attacks now he gets severe pain attacks like once a week and two three days he's not going for work so then we have to think of other alternate forms of pain relief so the interventions possible one thing is a radiological ablation of the celiac plexus another form to do is to do what is called as French resectomy because the pain fibers come from the sympathetic chain through the spranchnik nerves and it is it's possible to ablate the spranchnik nerves it's, it has to be done bilaterally a spranchnik nerve ablation has to be done in the chest since we have uh, thoracoscopy facilities in our unit so we plan for a bilateral spranchnisectomy because if this is done by open, of course, there's a lot of mobility of the surgery because both sides of the chest has to be open. So we discussed this option with him and we said that he has a fair chance that the pain will get relieved and he was so bothered he agreed for the surgery. So I'll show a short video clip uh, what we did on him. So you can see here the lung is collapsed to get the feel that's your descending aorta that's the sympathetic chain and you can very clearly see the splanchnic branches so we ablate the splanchnic branches with the diatomy hook so this is one way but now we tend to do uh, rather than ablating one by one we go down to the uh, the main splanchnic and just ablate that so it's just one so this is of course going on the spranchnik uh, branches i hope i have a, yeah now this is other on another patient i am showing you can see the main spranchnik nerve is being formed maybe one branch is coming from there so one thing you can go there and ablate the entire thing but there's a vein here so here what we did was we did this and then this other branch so he underwent this splanchnisectomy and uh, he his pain uh, settled down very well and he was very happy so he did not use uh, have to use any tramadol or diaclac all and off he had to use a paracetamol with some codeine and his diabetes was controlled he stopped the alcohol so he was very happy and uh, he his, uh, he didn't continue to lose weight so that's how this patient was managed and looking back the problems of chronic pancreatitis now here this one had the pain endocrine failure they were managed exocrine failure if it is there again it can be managed pharmacologically now in case one of these complications happen then what are we going to do that i will do discuss in another discussion as a continuation of this and also we should not forget that they need a social rehabilitation stop the alcohol and look at their uh, matters regarding the occupation so the social rehabilitation is very important so next discussion we will do as it's as an extension to this management of these problems